Let's open our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter number 27 today. We are looking at some of the prophecies that were generated during the siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians at God's command because of sin. And the Judeans are not the only ones that are coming under God's judgment. There are others as well. And so Prophet Jeremiah, Prophet Ezekiel are having to provide documentation about the impending judgment against those other places as well. And one of them that we've talked about recently was Tyre, the Phoenician city on the Mediterranean coast, a little bit north of the Judean Kingdom territory. They are in trouble because they seem to be enjoying all of the things happening to the Judean Kingdom. And so God has sent them a message that their sins are also known and judgment is coming. And so here's some more on that. Ezekiel chapter 27, perhaps written down during this time period that uh, Ezekiel was supposed to remain mute as part of his demonstration of what was impending for the Judeans. The word of he who is came to me. Now you, son of man, raise a lamentation over Tyre. So a very sad song over the demise of Tyre. Say to Tyre, who dwells at the entrances to the sea, merchants of the peoples to many coastlands, thus says he who is God. O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Your borders are in the heart of the seas. Your builders made perfect your beauty. And this is absolutely true. The Tyrians, the Phoenicians that lived at Tyre, had for a long time been the, the seafaring merchants of the Mediterranean basin. And they knew how to build beautiful cities and beautiful temples. You might remember that King David arranged for his son, King Solomon, to get expert assistance in the building of the temple and of his kingdom's buildings from the people of Phoenicia, from Tyre and Sidon. So they are well-known, world-renowned for that. Uh, they were also major shipbuilders, as you would expect, since they'd been plying the uh, Mediterranean waters and the, the waters of the Indian Ocean for quite some time. Uh, so it's interesting in this, this lamentation that uh, Tyre is described as being like this really decked out ship. So let's look at that. Verse 5. They made all your planks of fir trees from sinir. They took a cedar of Lebanon to make a mast for you. So these are the best places to get the wood for decking and for the mast. Of oaks of Bashan, they made your oars. So trees from the eastern side of the Jordan Valley. Nice, strong uh, oars. They made your deck of pines from the coasts of Cyprus, inlaid with ivory. So not only did they put in some really nice fine-grained pine decking from Cyprus, they also put decorations in places made of ivory. Of fine embroidered linen from Egypt was your sail, serving as your banner. So a really high thread count uh, sailcloth from Egypt with this decoration on it. Blue and purple from the coast of Elisha was your awning. Uh, so we're also going to have fabrics, you know, protecting uh, the people who have to work up on the deck. 
Uh, and uh, this is dyed with the special purple dye gotten uh, from plants and uh, sea creatures. Uh, the inhabitants of Sidon, or Sidon, and Arvad were your rowers. Your skilled men, O Tyre, were in you. They were your pilots. So Phoenicians that knew what they were doing in rowing and guiding. The elders of Gebel and her skilled men were in you, caulking your seams, making sure you're waterproof. All the ships of the sea with their mariners were in you to barter for your wares. So that's the description. Tyre was like this magnificent, top-of-the-line vessel, decked out and well-staffed, well-crewed. Verse 10, Persia and Lud and Put were in your army as your men of war. They hung the shield and helmet in you. They gave you splendor. Men of Arvad and Halak were on your walls all around, and men of Gamad were in your towers. They hung their shields on your walls all around. They made perfect your beauty. So now we've got uh, mercenaries that have been hired in, professional soldiers to come in and protect the city of Tyre, and they bring their uh, beautifully ornate shields with them. Tarshish did business with you. This is Tarshish in Spain, the far reaches of the Mediterranean uh, world. They did business with you because of your great wealth of every kind, silver, iron, tin, and lead they exchanged for your wares. And we know that these uh, particular uh, items were traded back and forth between the eastern end and the western end of the Mediterranean. And the Phoenicians were the ones that facilitated a lot of that. Javan, think the Greek areas of the northern Med, north central Med. Tubal and Meshach. Uh, Tubal probably equivalent to Blisi uh, in uh, our modern world. Uh, Meshach, some people want to make it Moscow, but it's much more likely that it's someplace down in what we call modern-day Turkey, not far from Tubal. Uh, they exchanged human beings and vessels of bronze for your merchandise. From Beth to Gomar, that's in ancient Turkey, uh, they exchanged horses, war horses, and mules for your wares. The men of Didan, that's down in the Arabian uh, Peninsula, uh, traded with you. Many coastlands were your own special markets. They brought you in pavement ivory tusks and ebony. What we're actually seeing here is that the, the Tyrian Phoenician trade routes were both over the waters as well as the trade routes overland that were tied to key port cities of those water trade routes. And so they've got tons of merchandise that's coming through uh, Tyre. Syria did business with you because of your abundant goods. They exchanged for your wares, emeralds, purple, embroidered work, fine linen, coral, and ruby. Judah and the land of Israel traded with you. They exchanged for your merchandise, wheat of minneth, meal, honey, oil, and balm. So now we're actually looking back even into the history when the northern country of Israel was still in existence. They did trade with the Tyrians. Judah continued to do trade throughout their existence. Damascus did business with you for your abundant goods because of your great wealth of every kind. Wine of Helbon, wool of Sahar, casks of wine from Uzel, they exchanged for your wares, wrought iron, Cassia, think cinnamon. Calamus were bartered for your merchandise. Did Dan traded with you in saddle claws for riding? Arabia, all the princes of Kedar were your favored dealers in lambs, rams, and goats. In these you did they did business with you. The traders of Sheba and Ra'ma traded with you. They exchanged for your wares the best of all kinds of spices and all precious stones and gold. Haran 
Kalna, Eden, treaters of Sheba. Now that's interesting because Haran and Kalna, that seems to be up in Mesopotamia. Eden, that is probably modern-day Yemen, uh, western Yemen. And Sheba, uh, uh, the interior part of um, southern Saudi Arabia, uh, seems to be Sheba. Uh, Ashur and Gilmad traded with you. In your market, these traded with you in choice garments, in cloths of blue and embroidered work, and in carpets of colored material bound with cords made secure. The ships of Tarshish traveled for you with your merchandise. Now, the ships of Tarshish here, I think, would not necessarily be ships only traveling to Tarshish in Spain, but rather a style of ship that was used both in the Mediterranean and in the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, Gulf of Suez, Gulf of, uh, of Aqaba area. So they, you were filled and heavily laden in the heart of the seas. So you get the impression here, these guys had it made. They, for a long time, had been the wealthy, wide-ranging merchants of the ancient world. Verse 26, your rowers have brought you out into the high seas. So now we're back to that illustration that Tyre is like this finely appointed monster ship. The east wind has wrecked you in the heart of the seas. Uh Uh-oh, now we've got bad stuff happening. Your riches, your wares, your merchandise, your mariners and your pilots, your caulkers, your dealers in merchandise, all your men of war who are in you, with all your crew that is in your midst, sink into the heart of the seas on the day of your fall. So it's all falling apart as God's judgment falls. At the sound of the cry of your pilots, the countryside shakes, and down from their ships come all who handle the oar. The mariners and all the pilots of the sea stand on the land, and they shout aloud over you. That is, they're upset. And they cry bitterly. They cast dust on their heads and they wallow in ashes. They make themselves bald for you. These are all examples of ancient practices of grief. And they put sackcloth on their waist. They weep over you in bitterness of soul with bitter mourning. In their wailing, they raise a lamentation for you and lament over you. Oh, who is like Tyre? like one destroyed in the midst of the sea. When your wares came from the seas, you satisfied many peoples. With your abundant wealth and merchandise, you enriched the kings of the earth. And now you are wrecked by the seas in the depths of the waters. Your merchandise and all your crew in your midst have sunk with you. All the inhabitants of the coastlands are appalled at you, and the hair of their kings bristles with horror. Their faces are convulsed. The merchants around, among the people hiss at you. That is, they're shocked. You've come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. And of course, we don't hear about Phoenicians anymore. Uh, they kind of go by the wayside. Uh, in this time between Nebuchadnezzar attacking Tyre and taking down the mainland city, and when Alexander the Great came through and uh, conquered the uh, island by pushing the debris of the mainland city out uh, into a causeway to the island. He he battered down that wall uh, and uh, destroyed the, the Phoenician people of Tyre and brought them into his... Uh, his Greek-style kingdom. And so the Phoenicians are probably kaput from that point onward. Uh, Chapter 28, we will find very interesting, I think, as we continue more of God's condemnation, prediction of the judgment of Tyre. The word of he who is came to me, son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says he who is God. So talk to the government leader of this city. Because your heart is proud, and you have said, I am a God. Uh, The word God, Elohim, has the idea of a mighty one. And it is not just simply referring to 
the true and living God in many passages. It's used often of the gods and goddesses of the mythologies of the Middle East. Uh, And it is also used for leadership persons. Because you've said, I am a god, I'm a mighty one. I sit in the seat of the gods, in the heart of the seas. Yet you are but a man and no god, though you make your heart like the heart of a god. So this is all because you're so full of yourself. Verse 3, you are indeed wiser than Daniel. That's sarcasm. That's tongue-in-cheek. Daniel, of course, is very famous at this moment. He's up in Babylon uh, as the leader of uh, of Babylon government. He's the number two guy in the kingdom. Uh, Very, very wise. Uh, So God says through Ezekiel to this tire king, Oh, yeah, you're wiser than Daniel. No secret is hidden from you. By your wisdom and your understanding, you've made wealth for yourself. You've gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in your trade, you've increased your wealth, and your heart has become proud in your wealth. And therefore, thus says he who is God, because you make your heart like the heart of a god, Therefore, behold, I will bring foreigners against you, the most ruthless of the nations. That would be starting with the Babylonians. And they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall thrust you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the heart of the seas. Will you still say I'm a god in the presence of those who kill you? Though you're not but a man and no God in the hands of those who slay you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of foreigners, for I have spoken, declares he who is God. So that's the prediction that the leader, the government leader, the king, the prince of Tyre is going to die when the Babylonians sweep through. Now comes the very intriguing thing. We've had all this conversation, all this uh, criticism of pride. And in the next passage, he continues talking against the king of Tyre, but it feels like from some of the wording, he's talking to someone else at the same time. An entity that probably rabble-roused with the king of Tyre. And so many, many of us who do commentary believe that God is talking to Satan in this next section. Now, there'll be things that will eventually come back to the physical king of Tyre. But there's a lot in here that's not about the king of Tyre, but rather about Satan himself. Here we go. Moreover, The word of he who is came to me, son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says he who is God. So the true king of Tyre, the the puppet master that's pulling the strings. You were the signet of perfection. Seems to be this idea of the perfect example, the perfect seal, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now that is not true of the king of Tyre, is it? Every precious stone was your covering, uh, or on your clothing, if you will. Sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. And again, we've got a little bit of debate about some of the Hebrew phraseology here. Some people see in here mentions of musical instruments. I feel that it's more got to do with the description of Satan in his most natural form so that he looks like a living jewel. I believe that the Gerubim, which... Satan seems to be one of them, is actually a crystal entity. Not made up of flesh and blood like we are. 
but rather made up of crystals. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. That is, all of your beauty in all of these different uh, jewels and semi-precious stones and metals that are mentioned. Verse 14, you were an anointed guardian kerub. Now, the anointed part, that's Mashiach. That's the idea of Messiah, somebody that's set aside for a job. Prophets, priests, and kings were all anointed with special holy oil. So, this kerub is specially prepared for something. Uh, now, kerub, uh, the word appears in a similar form in other languages of the Middle East from this time, and it has something to do with um, uh, uh, special position of covering. Uh, of Guardian does not quite hit the mark properly because that gives the sense of something's being attacked. Um, fencing, uh, walling uh, apart, which really is tied in with something from the Genesis passage where we first meet the Kerubim, because when Adam and Eve sinned, they were pushed out of the Garden of Eden, and God stationed Kerubim at the border to prevent them from coming back in again. And then later, when uh, the tabernacle was built, the decorations in it portrayed the, the Kerubim as stopping sinful man from getting too close to holy God. So I think that that is probably a representation of where the Kerubim started. We've seen some things in Ezekiel earlier where the Kerubim seem to be at the base of God's Shekinah glory tower, just underneath his throne. Uh, they might also be involved in communication because inside the area of the four Kerubim underneath God's throne that we saw earlier in the book of Ezekiel are the coals of fire that in the book of Revelation seem to be tied up with uh, prayer. All right, so you were an anointed guardian kerub. I placed you. Uh, you were in the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. That's again, those stones of fire that's inside the the tower of God's presence uh, just underneath his throne where you've got the four uh, Garabim with their whirling uh, wheels within wheels. And so here we hear about this particular guardian in the Garden of Eden walking perfectly there. Verse 15, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. Uh, th at this point, uh, when I'm just talking about the the angelic world. I'll draw in from Isaiah chapter 14, which in a similar fashion seems to be talking to and about Satan while critiquing a physical king for his sin and his pride. And so it would appear that between those two passages, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah chapter 14, we've got a better understanding that Satan started out in the perfect Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve present, behaving himself, even functioning as a go-between. Um, and uh, then he sinned. How did he sin? He got it in his head. He was better than humanity, better than God, and he ought to be in charge. And that seems to be where his great uh, attack upon humanity began where he, he manipulated Eve first and through her Adam and started this whole process that we're still in the middle of this spiritual war. So here in this passage, I find intriguing uh, backstory uh, to Genesis chapter 3. All right, now verse number uh, 16. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. Uh, now the trade here might be as in the abundance of your business, your interaction in the Garden of Eden, 
the things that he'd been tasked to do. He got full of himself about it. Verse 16, so I cast you as profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian Gerub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Revelation chapter number 12, we see a picture of the great dragon drawing a third of the stars out of heaven and casting them to the earth. And many of us think that that's uh, another another backstory of what happened uh, when Satan manipulated the situation in Genesis chapter 3, and part of the curse was he was no longer welcome in God's direct presence. And it all has to do with pride, which was also the problem with the king of Tyre. And so that's why we find this all here together. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. See you next week.